Hello, dear listeners and viewers. Here we are at Kardec Radio this morning. July 4th is coming up. It's the weekend of the celebration of freedom around the world, beginning with our beautiful nation, the United States of America. And we're inviting you to be here with us. Yes, we are here in a very special celebration of the sixth anniversary of Kardec Radio. And it couldn't be any better than to have someone who really is for thinking and feeling, and especially giving a hand to academia as well, teasing its paradigm at the core of it all. Dr. Eben Alexander is here with us and directly from the area of Thomas Jefferson. Yes, near Charlottesville, Virginia. Thank you so much, Dr. Eben Alexander III, for being with us this morning at Kardec Radio. How are you? I'm doing great, Vanessa. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, it's great. I remember when we have we had like a brief conversation years ago uh, in the company also of Dr. Raymond Moody Jr., a friend and collaborator of yours and a person who has also been bringing this understanding that life is much more than the ice can see. For those who are watching us, Dr. Eben Alexander, I want to give them the reference of the website, ebenalexander.com. And you know, he is a renowned academic neurosurgeon who spent three decades in his scientific works. And then one day, everything changed. And I would say in a few days, everything changed. He had his own experience on near death experience. And then from their own life, life transformed to the point that he's here today talking to us about what happened next. So Dr. Eben Alexander, being a neuroscientist myself, I've come to know in academia that there is a specific paradigm in the search for the truth. You were in that pathway under that paradigm but then one day everything changed. For those who are coming in today and are not acquainted with it, which I doubt, but just to recap, what happened? Where were you when everything, I mean, mind-wise, everything changed and how has it changed? Well, I think it's important to point out uh, how I had started all this. I spent mm -hmm. the four, 54 years of my life honing a very kind of materialist scientific worldview. Uh, I had gone to a Methodist church as a child in North Carolina, wanted to believe in an afterlife, the reality of God and the power of prayer. Uh, but through those many decades spent in neurosurgery, I was more and more perplexed by how in the world uh, conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. And to me, that was uh, a deep mystery. And I, I bought into the teachings of scientific materialism, which basically says the physical world is all that exists that the brain uh, is, the physical brain is the creator of consciousness and that our existence uh, is birth to death and nothing more. And uh, I bought into that fully. Now, never mind the fact that nobody who studied the brain had any remote idea of how it might be producing consciousness. We all just figured that if we worked hard and studied it enough, we would find out how that happened. But it turns out that the fundamental assumption is wrong. And that is the assumption that only the physical exists and that the brain uh, as a physical entity must somehow be created. And that lesson began uh, November 10th, 2008 at 4.30 in the morning, waking up with severe back pain. Soon thereafter, realizing I had a horrific headache. Uh, and uh, literally within uh, uh, the first hour or so of those kind of realizations, I was already slipping into coma. And so finally, when I... I developed grand mal epileptic seizures that were unbreakable. My family realized something horrible was in this. They called 911. The EMTs came to the house, uh, packaged me up, took me off to the emergency room. Of course, I remember none of that at all. I had lost consciousness and was gone from this world uh, in my bed early that morning. Um, and then I found out much of what happened uh, around me for the, the next week. And uh, those lessons are all reported in my book, Proof of Heaven. 
Uh, but it, it has to do with the fact that uh, I was taken to the emergency room. They did a lumbar puncture, uh, determined very quickly I had a severe gram-negative bacterial meningitis. My neurologist determined that even in the emergency room that it was a very devastating case, that my neocortex, the human part of the brain, was already badly inactivated uh, by this uh, infection. And for any doctors out there in the audience, they'll realize when they hear the medical details of this case with a CSF glucose of one when it's normally 60 to 80 and that kind of thing, plus my neurologic exams that were so devastating, they had plenty of evidence that the human part of my brain was gone even when I got to that emergency room. Uh, and they estimated my survival probability around 10% at that point. But by the end of a week in coma, after triple antibiotics for that week being on a ventilator up on the medical ICU, they estimated I was down to a 2% chance of survival, no chance of recovery. Uh, and it was soon after that I started coming back to this world. And the only thing I knew when I came back to this world was where I had just been. Uh, that was an incredible journey. But in fact, such things as words, language, uh, all of my personal memories of Evan Alexander's life, all my religious beliefs, every single bit of that, all my scientific knowledge, spent more than uh, uh, almost three uh, decades spent in academic nursing. The interesting thing uh, is I remembered, as I said, where I'd just been. And that's the uh, spiritual odyssey that I describe in Proof of Heaven. But important to point out for your listening audience that according to conventional neuroscience, there is no way that that experience happened. It couldn't happen. Uh, there's no way that such a brain produces a hallucination or dream or drug effect or anything that would give me the ultra real spiritual experience that I encountered. And that was the challenge that faced me in the weeks of coming back to this world, especially as I started to learn by going back to follow up visits with my doctors uh, and also going through my medical records and scans, just how ill I had been. I came to realize well, that patient whose medical record I was reviewing had absolutely zero way of having a robust, rich, hyper real conscious experience because the neocortex would have been necessary for any part of that detailed conscious awareness. And yet my doctors knew full well that mine was gone. Uh, it all That experience that I did know when I first came back to this world all began in the earthworm's eye view, a very primitive, coarse, unresponsive realm, like being in dirty jello. But I was rescued from that by this slowly spinning uh, kind of pure musical melody, a white light, a great clarity uh, that spun and, and opened up like a portal uh, and uh, em let me emerge my awareness from the darkness of that murky underground earthworm eye view realm up into a rich, beautiful, ultra real gateway valley of kind of ideals, everything perfect, uh, creative, that no signs of any death or decay. Uh, there were thousands of beings down below that were dancing, lots of joy and merriment. And later on in my writings, I called them angelic. Uh, I called them uh, souls between lives. And it was all being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of golden light, leaving sparkling golden trails that in my early writings when I came back to this world, I labeled uh, as angelic choirs. And it was the anthems and chants and hymns that they were emanating that thundered through me and, and showed the ultra reality of this realm and all of its beauty and the uh, absolutely indescribable feeling of that love, of that creative source, of that deity, that God, uh, going through all of it. And the beautiful message from the girl on the butterfly wing you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You will be taken care of, which, of course, are the central messages of the book. And yet that valley proved only a stepping stone to higher and higher levels. I remember seeing all of space and time collapsing down uh, in this four dimensional space time realm of ours. Plus, uh, all of that collapsing down too, in higher and higher levels of a multi dimensional uh, universe until I was outside of every bit of it. Witnessing it is this incredibly complex oversteer, but in that realm, in that core realm, overflowing with the love of that divine, infinitely healing power of that God, that deity, that in fact, when I came back to this world, I called Om, because to me, coming back to this world, the word God was a puny little human word with a lot of baggage that didn't remotely describe the power and majesty and awe and beautiful infinite love of that being uh, in that core realm. And yet, of course, as time went on, I came to realize, of course, that deity is the same as God. 
or Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh. I don't care what words you use, the words get in the way. They introduce confusion where the deep mystical traditions of all the great faiths are in agreement about this incredible power of love and of connectedness and of oneness that connects us all and connects us with the divine. And I came to see that God in an entirely new way that to mm. me was completely uh, refreshing. And then I began to realize that it's perfectly in alignment with millions of other uh, similar spiritually transformative experiences, including not only near death experiences, but shared death, which are the same experiences, but happening to people who are physiologically healthy and normal, uh, either at the bedside of a departing loved one or maybe a thou thousands of miles away. But as the loved one departs, their soul comes through and wakes us up to that reality in no uncertain terms. But the reality of that realm is what I was really coming to see. And every bit of this is about a complete redefinition of our notions of the relationship of the brain and mind, which is what uh, I go into in my third book that was co-written with my life partner, Karen Newell, who is the founder of Sacred Acoustics. And Karen and I have just finished this book. It's called Living in a Mindful Universe, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Heart of Consciousness. And that book will be coming out October 17th of 2017. And it is really the natural sequel to Proof of Heaven and uh, reveals how, in fact, my journey of discovery around my NDE mirrors perfectly the awakening coming to the entire scientific community about the mind-body uh, connection, the relationship between brain and mind, and how all of us are awakening to a far richer view of what that really involves in the nature of reality. Uh, we've been more than 3,000 years in the making for this awakening of humanity, and it is not going to disappoint. We're in the middle of it right now. Yes, you're right. And isn't it interesting that we have some form of paradoxical society now? I'm sorry, that question kind of broke up. Can you repeat that? So uh, we just want to recap what you mentioned about the view of science nowadays. And science, though... Uh, in a materialistic paradigm does not reflect itself purely in society because our justice system, our educational system is not, it doesn't see the person as a byproduct of the brain. We punish people for, for going to the wrong route. I remember Michael Gazaninga, the renowned the Gazaninga talking about uh, his latest studies and saying, you know, if it is really true that the person is the byproduct of the brain, then our justice system is really twisted because we're punishing people for having broken brains. So uh, you know better than me that this is the, the longstanding view in academia. And uh, you were there before you had this experience. So the, the main question here for us is, where were those spiritual values in you? Where were you in terms of before you had this spiritual experience? And I, I would say like this multidimensional experience. What did you believe in before it all? Well, I, I really did buy into the kind of materialist uh, worldview, the materialist scientific worldview. And that's, or physicalism as it's called. And that's the notion really, that the physical world is the only thing that exists. Well, it turns out, though, that for the last 115 years, uh, the science of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, has been trying to reintroduce the notion of consciousness or mind back into our ideas about reality, uh, to really get the kind of pathologic nature of this whole thought process that's led us to such an error in our thinking um, you really have to look over at la the last, uh, you know, three to four centuries of the, the rise of uh, the scientific revolution uh, and of materialism and this general notion buried deep in the middle of it that uh, you have the scientist, the human, as the observer of the natural world and that that observer is independent and can thus make uh, statements about the way the natural world works. Uh, and in its uh, craziest form, 
This goes all the way out to naturalism, which uh, basically is the idea that there's no such thing as spirit or consciousness, that it's all just the material world, all those subatomic particles going through their dance, all dictated by the laws of physics and chemistry that in fact would take that materialist mindset to a, a position of saying there's no free will in a human being at all because that materialist science so proudly claims that the physical is all that exists. And if consciousness is just the epiphenomenon of the chemical reactions and electrical fluxes of the physical matter of the brain, then obviously our very thoughts uh, and awareness is simply uh, the result of a chemical experiment following natural laws. And so free will itself must be a, a tremendous illusion. Now, uh, that's kind of the, the heightened insanity of it. If you carry that materialist thinking to the nth degree, kind of along the lines of your discussion leading up to your question, that would mean that no one is responsible for their actions at all because their brain isn't even broken. Uh, it's all following natural laws. So uh, none of us have any responsibility or will at all. We're just being dragged along on this uh, ride. That is not true. And yet that is the insanity of that false separation that uh, the whole scientific revolution model was putting to us by denying that the observer is part of the universe. And it's that false separation that leads to such incredible errors in understanding. Uh, and this is something that Karen and I go into in great detail in our book coming out in October, Living in a Mindful Universe, is this thing we call the supreme illusion. Uh, that in fact, none of us uh, has ever experienced the world out there directly, which is kind of what the illusion puts to us. We think, well, there's all that stuff out there. I mean, look around me, look at the house around me with the plants and the walls and the lights and then outside the trees and the clouds and the sky. Um, I'm not experiencing any of that directly. What I'm experiencing is an internal construct within mind that I assume is a faithful representation of what is out there. But the interesting thing about experiments in quantum physics, uh, which are about the very fundamental nature of all that stuff around us, and that includes the stuff that makes up my physical body and my brain, is that all that stuff is very much part of the Maya. It's part of a construct within mind that's a modeling mechanism trying to pretend that we're all modeling the same external physical reality that's independent of us. But that is false. And it's the whole notion of a false sense of separation uh, that really is built into our, our modern science. Um, a generic name for our modern conventional scientific view of the world is something called reductive materialism, which mm. means basically that only the material world exists. That's all that stuff I'm talking about that we witness mm. out there that we can touch and feel and see and, and hear. Uh, and that's that material world. And yet, again, we're only experiencing an internal construct of that. And that's the beginning of unraveling this Maya and starting to realize that our soul or consciousness is the thing that absolutely exists. And in fact, all of that physical world is a projection out of consciousness. And this is something that, of course, I've, I've learned to really appreciate on a daily basis through meditation. For the last seven years plus, I've tried to meditate an hour, two or three a day. Uh, for those who think, wait a minute, I can't meditate. I've got too much of a monkey mind, that little voice in my head, our thoughts. You know, that is not our consciousness. Uh, the voice in our head, uh, the voice of our ego in particular, um, is little more than a parlor trick. Now, your consciousness, to start to get deeper into this, is the observer. It's the awareness. And that's where meditation can be so powerful. Because in meditation, in my preferred tool for those who fight that little monkey mind like I did before, uh, is sacred acoustics. And for those who are interested, all you have to do is visit sacredacoustics.com. Uh, Karen Newell, who runs that site, has some um, uh, free downloads and some excellent uh, instructional videos to help people learn very quickly uh, and for free how to get involved in this kind of listening and using these sounds, listening through headphones. It has tremendous power because we're actually using the differential frequency of the sounds hitting the two ears 
to basically modulate a circuit in the lower brain stem to set your conscious awareness free. And I'm not going to sit here and talk about the mechanism anymore. You have to try it to understand just how powerful uh, this is. I mean, loosely termed, it's called binaural beats, but I would say Sacred Acoustics has done an incredible job of refining these and making them far more powerful than anything else I've ever witnessed. And I use these routinely to return to those realms of my near-death experience and to develop very powerful ongoing relationships with with the beings and entities and the incredible uh, the core of all that is. And that is something that each and every one of us can come to uh, develop and cultivate by going within. When you start realizing the physical brain is not the creator of consciousness, but in fact is only a reducing valve or filter that allows primordial, infinitely creative consciousness uh, that is the source of this entire observable physical universe, every bit of that contained within that consciousness. And we each have the ability to transcend the veil that I would say is pretty much provided by our ne neocortex and tra tra uh, traversing that veil um, enables us to uh, far greater insight, wisdom, creativity, guidance in living our lives, connection with souls of departed loved ones, with other grand masters uh, throughout all of human history. We have access to that universal mind by going within. And this is one of the greatest gifts of the coming scientific revolution in this deeper understanding of the relationship of brain and mind. And you talk a lot about it in the map of heaven for those who are watching and listening to us. And, uh, you know, we've touched a subject that I, I would like that we extend a little more talking about the, the balance of the mind and achieving this wellness the, the, the holistic sense of wellness in the spiritist movement around the world, especially in Brazil, you've heard about Kardec's works and the works that continue. And there are psychiatric hospitals in Brazil that are approaching uh, mental illness from a different angle, considering the, the spirit, the spirit attachments, etc. So through laying on of hands, with uh, mediumistic meetings to do the spirit release therapy, what we call obsession, et cetera, et cetera. So do you see, based on the works you have been unfolding, do you see the possibility of uh, such works actually being extended throughout our, our planet to the point that academia is going to surrender itself one day to the evidence that we're much more than physical body? Oh, I'm sure academia, there's no way out other than a consolidation of science and spirituality. Neither one can move forward independently of the other. We're spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe. And in fact, I would say every bit of this is about healing. Healing is becoming more whole, more complete. Each and every one of us is on this world, and although we might tend to look at the imperfections in our lives and say, uh, why this imperfection? Uh, why this, uh, this thing that appears to be wrong in my life? What I came back from my journey realizing is that all of the challenges in life, the hurdles and difficulties, and especially this includes illness and injury that we face, these are all beautiful gifts. They are stepping stones that allow the growth of our soul. It's by recovering the oneness that we share with this universe, the love that the creative source has for each and every one of us, that we come to realize that in a deep sense, as I mentioned in Proof of Heaven, all is well. At every moment, all is well. This is another way of saying uh, one of those uh, deep statements from the guardian angel on the butterfly wing, along with, oh, you have nothing to fear, um, and you will be taken care of was the statement, you can do no wrong. And that one is misinterpreted by more people. The reality is this is soul school. We are here to learn and teach these lessons. And the lessons come in the form of these apparent imperfections. And that also includes all the apparent ages, uh, agents of darkness and, and evil in our world. Uh, this is all part of a grand gift of desperation. Just that's a term from the addiction literature, how people often hit a bottom in alcoholism or drug addiction. They hit a bottom that hopefully is above a point where 
uh, they're able to survive because as many people know, sometimes that bottom is such that you don't survive it and the addiction takes your life. And that is always uh, just another way of looking at this as soul school. But I'm talking now about rising above that, developing that observer self within, the one that in meditation can realize that your thoughts and certainly the all those little petty concerns of the ego um, are part of this dance. But we gain so much by rising above and taking that bigger view and realizing that one of the greatest gifts we can do is recover that love for self. I came back from my journey realizing that the vast majority of the world's problems are because we don't even love ourselves enough. People think the tough part is loving your neighbor, uh, loving your enemy. Well, guess what? Loving yourself first would solve the vast majority of the world's problems and remembering our divine connectedness to all that is, that in fact, the best choice to make in our lives in dealing with our fellow beings is a choice of love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, and mercy. Uh, realizing that ultimately, to get us out of this uh, world of conflict that we see today, as much as we might talk about battling evil and, and stamping out our enemies and all of that, is realizing that at the end of the day, the thing that's going to make difference uh, will be acts of kindness and compassion to others. And those ultimately will erase all of that bad darkness and evil. And we each have the choice in our own life decisions on a daily basis to choose that love and compassion and acts of kindness. And those ultimately will make the big difference in healing this world because this unconditional love that I discuss is the, the healing force that it is, has infinite power to heal at all levels. And this is simply a way of acknowledging that, that this is really all about healing and opening our hearts to this far grander view of reality and how our consciousness can shape every bit of it. You know, we're almost speechless here because <laughs> you really touched the core of it all. But, you know, seeing the world as it is nowadays, Dr. Alexander, it's very, it's a, it's a wonderful gift to have you in the world advocating for <laughs> the, the, the truth of life in itself. But do, do you have, there, there are people who have asked us, if you found in your new pathway resistance, from former colleagues or other people, because we know academia can be quite, you know, closed. How has it been in that regard? You, you really open a new pathway of discoveries and, and research and investigation, both individual and collective. So how has it been in that regard? Have you found much resistance or not? I've actually found just a tremendous amount of support from the uh, you know, fellow neurosurgeons, other doctors, uh, scientists, physicists who, who fully get how the materialist paradigm is so fatally flawed. And it's really uh, kind of amazing that our materialist paradigm in science has lasted the last hundred years. We've had all the evidence there that mind is fundamental in the universe, and yet materialist science uh, is just absolutely adamant about not accepting this very fundamental uh, evidence uh, about the nature of reality. And in fact, this is something that Karen and I go into in great detail in that book, Living in a Mindful Universe, coming out in October, uh, is the fact that this is the only resistance I ran into in, in uh, kind of publications out there on the internet and, and other uh, mainstream publications about my case were were either supportive kinds or occasionally uh, there was, uh, say, for example, someone who claimed to be in scientific circles or have scientific understanding, but had no idea what the medical details that I describe in Proof of Heaven mean. Because most doctors who know enough about gram-negative bacterial meningitis and about a patient being in a coma for a week from such a disease realize the impossibility of having any kind of rich hallucination drug effect uh, dream state or confabulation at all in that setting. You basically have no experience at all. And what little experience you might have can't possibly be laid down in memory. So my, my entire uh, experience and memory of it completely violated everything modern neuroscience would try and tell you about the brain creating consciousness. 
And the, the evidence has been there for ages that the brain is not the creator of consciousness at all. For those in clinical neuroscience, what I would point out are those episodes of terminal lucidity where elderly demented patients who might not have said a meaningful phrase for weeks or months uh, as they approach death can have great clarity of thought, in, insight, reflection uh, in discussing uh, their lives with uh, loved ones at the bedside, often when they may have no brain left to make such a conversation. Uh, and I have one example of terminal lucidity in my book, but there, those examples are out there in the, uh, the hospice world and the medical world. There are books on terminal lucidity. Uh, it definitely is a very real event. Likewise, acquired savant syndrome, where some form of brain damage, whether it be uh, head trauma, a stroke, uh, autism, things like that, they can unmask superhuman mental capacities, like the ability to calculate pi to 3,000 digits in one's head, the ability to look at a phone book one page per second, uh, and then after looking through 100 pages, somebody can ask you, what is John Smith's uh, name? You just saw that in, in those last 100,000 names you looked at, and you can reel off the phone number. Uh, people have incredible abilities after brain damage, important to point out. And then another point that we make, and those who are interested can follow my blog posting back in April of 2016 on this, uh, but how uh, psychedelic drugs um, like psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca with DMT, et cetera, um, experiments with both functional MRI and magnetoencephalography to assess such patients has found the shocking conclusion that the people with the most robust psychedelic drug experiences have the greatest shutting down of the physical activity of their brain. It's the exact opposite of what the materialist scientists would try and postulate about the relationship between brain activity and extraordinary uh, mental experience. Um, and yet this is what is shown in repeated laboratory settings uh, is the most profound psychedelic experiences are accomplished with the greatest shutting down and darkening of activity in the physical brain. And that is not to be denied as an absolutely crucial piece of evidence. It's exactly what happened to me is my neocortex was progressively decimated by this uh, extremely lethal and should have killed me bacterial infection. My conscious awareness was actually liberated to a much higher level. That is in fact why I was attracted to binaural beats beginning about two years after I came out of coma in trying to go into meditation to get into deep transcendental states was I found uh, enough evidence that uh, these differential sound frequencies intersecting in the lower brainstem can have some really amazing effects on shed setting your conscious awareness free and showing you how the here and now is an illusion built in on this side of the veil. It is part of what emerges out of consciousness allowed through the filter, but not an under uh, underlying part of reality itself. It's interesting, it's interesting. you're making me about yeah. my I know you no, talk, you talk about, about it in the book. Apple Apple has has can you hear me well? Yeah? A little bit. Just uh, right into the microphone, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So uh, it's interesting you're mentioning about meditation because recently we were in our community studying uh, mediumistic works, uh, revealing unique passages by Jesus when he was living on the earth. And uh, it's it's amazing how much they describe that often, often he was meditating and people are not fully aware because they think of Jesus Christ, for example, as a talking master. And more often than not, he was very, he was reflecting, he was meditating, he would retreat, he would not be arguing. And again, you come and bring that awareness that it's the, the self-love, it's that inner encounter, that encounter with God. But what made you, this question still remains, I remember talking to several friends about this. You know, many people have had their near-death experiences and uh, they come from all different walks of life. In your case, what made you make this decision, like to go public and to really reach out to the world in the way that you're doing? Well, you know, a major disadvantage uh, for many people is they don't realize what a miracle it is that uh, I'm here. Uh, and, and that uh, is a real shocker. I know some of the doctors who had taken care of me that I ran into months later who just assumed that I had gone on to die 
when I would run into them, they would literally turn white as a sheet uh, and, and they'd just be shaking. I mean, and so that was what I had to go through was that discovery of that process. Because when I first came back to this world, all I knew was where I had just been. I had no memories of my life before, no words or language, although words and language came back literally within hours, <clears throat> personal memories within a few weeks. All of my semantic knowledge, <clears throat> say of physics, chemistry, neuroscience, cosmology, et cetera, returned over about eight weeks. And shockingly, when it all came back, it was more complete than it had been before. And that was only something I came to realize over the next few years, because I would have certain conversations with people that mirrored conversations I'd had before coma. And what I say, I came to realize was that my memories were more complete. It's a beautiful example of how physical memories are not stored in the brain at all. That is one of the deepest and most profound nails in the coffin of scientific materialism. But the more we've assumed we would find a location for memory in the brain uh, for decades, and what we keep finding is there is no such location. The memory serves... I mean, the brain serves as an antenna that allows for the transmission of memory and of conscious experience from that higher realm. But none of it is being created within the substance of the brain. And this, to me, was a, a major revelation. And it's something that we go into in that book, Living in a Mindful Universe, is how important it is to realize that given that we're not finding any locale for memory storage in the brain, and in fact, the evidence from neurosurgical experience over the long period of the 20th and early 21st century completely defies any kind of notion of memories being diffusely stored in the neocortex. Doesn't work at all, never has. In fact, Dr. Wilder Penfield, one of the most renowned neurosurgeons of the 20th century, who probably is in better position to talk about this than just about anybody because his entire career involved electrically stimulating the surface of the brain in awake patients. And I've done many of those cases myself. I know the, uh, the pitfalls and the potentialities of that kind of, uh, of work in clinical neuroscience to connect a phenomenological experience with electrical stimulation of the brain. And he wrote a book based on his uh, life experience of all these cases and all these patients in 1975 called The Mystery of the Mind. Uh, and in that book, Dr. Penfield makes it very clear that the brain does not create mind at all and don't expect to find memory or free will in the brain. The brain is simply a filtering mechanism that allows our conscious awareness in. It is not the creator of it at all. And all of neuroscience is going along this pathway. If you Google the hard problem of consciousness, you'll find a glimpse of what I'm talking about. It's the deepest mystery known to all of human thought over the last few millennia. And that is this mind-body relationship. Uh, and that's what we're talking about now. And that's what the book Living in a Mindful Universe is all about, is exactly this question that has been uh, dominating human thought at the highest levels for the last hundred generations of humans. You would think we'd be getting closer to some answers. Well, in fact, we probably finally are, but it only has to do with truly uh, accepting the deep mystery that quantum physics is trying to force on us. And you, you run into major problems with quantum physics uh, mainly when you try and put it, frame it, just like consciousness in the mind-body question, try and frame it from a purely physicalist standpoint. You know, the notion that only the physical exists and therefore the physical must somehow explain the brain creating consciousness. But if you flip it completely, uh, not to a, a compromise position, I would say on the one hand, end of the spectrum, we have the materialist position, brain creates uh, mind which we're all agreeing is false. That's never gone anywhere and never will. And then we have a whole spectrum of dualities of some kind of interrelation of brain and mind where it's not just one uh, completely reducible to the other. Uh, but then we finally get to the opposite pole, which is the one of, of metaphysical idealism or ontological idealism, which is a position that we push very strongly in living in a mindful universe. Uh, and that is the position that all of the universe is a creation within mind, that consciousness is the fundamental creator of all that is. 
And of course, this is where you start seeing the benefit of meditation and of going within. Because in fact, if my brain is not the creator of this conscious experience of mine, but it's only allowing in a far grander creative source of consciousness that's the, the, the basis of all of this universe, then I start to see where mm, maybe this could get fairly interesting. And yes, indeed it does. And the first true gift of it uh, is a gift of healing and a gift of oneness and a gift of of love and seeing that love is really the binding force. And the best way to express that love for self is actually to serve as a channel to bring that love from that core, the core of this universe and share it, spread it out because we are all one with this universe, one with all fellow beings. Uh, and so that particular manifestation of that oneness uh, is a giant step towards achieving the harmony uh, that is our birthright as sentient beings in this self-aware universe. So you're very grateful to that dramatic experience because you really calibrated you to your role in this life, right? I, I would say gratitude is the only appropriate response to every breath we take. And gratitude is such a crucial part. If people only realize just how powerful gratitude and forgiveness, those two concepts have incredible power to change this world and shift it up for the better. Uh, no matter what one's uh, circumstances in life or one's situation on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, remembering that gratitude, appreciating the beauty of this uh, this gift we call life that comes at us with all these apparent imperfections and uh, even the kind of darkness and evil, again, by taking this higher road, by developing that observer within, we can come to see all of conflict, all of this kind of interaction, this beautiful dance of our existence uh, as something that is very purposeful, uh, that leads us in a direction that uh, is extremely positive, that really puts human free will back in the driver's seat of determining the destiny of our evolution. Uh, in fact, I would say all of this is very much an evolution of consciousness. As uh, uh, Tillard de Chardin pointed out in The Phenomenon of Man, published in the mid-20th century, uh, he saw this uh, incredible omega point uh, towards which uh, we were uh, evolving. And I would say that's very much what's going on, but that the, the lesson that has challenged humanity for the last 2,000 years is this lesson of love. And it's one that we certainly have not adopted fully planet-wide, but I believe we are uh, on the verge of that because we really have to. Uh, there's no other way out uh, for this world. The status quo is not working. Uh, we've created incredible uh, havoc in this world uh, with our science and technology that was not necessarily bridled with human spirit and with uh, that knowing of the oneness of love and of connectedness. And uh, it was really the unbridling of science and technology that led uh, chemists uh, to commit their sin in World War I with poison gases, the physicists to commit their sin in World War II with uh, atomic weapons. If we ever fight a World War III, I'm sure that World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we're not going to be stupid enough to make another foolish scientific mistake that allows for an enhancement of warfare. It's time to put human spirit back in charge. And that's what quantum physics has been trying to do all along. Uh, so this really is a synthesis of science and spirituality and a bringing forth of the deepest lessons of quantum physics, which are trying to prove to us that consciousness is fundamental in the universe and that consciousness has the power to create the world of our dreams. Uh, and the more we, each and every one of us, awaken to that, uh, the more capable we will be of changing this world for the better. Yes, you know, it's amazing. We are, wow, we, we, I, I'm glad that this is being recorded because it's going to go on and on and on. And we have two major core questions here that I'm going to synthesize, bringing uh, the comments of the listeners here. First of all, regarding this push 
to the shift of paradigm in the collective, of course, it's, as you're saying, it's, it's coming up. There is enough evidence. I know, for example, there is the medical, the Spiritist Medical Association, the international, the U.S. chapter. Brazil just had a major thousands of people attending uh, this conference that really shifts the paradigm and tries to bring the the the, the healthcare approach to another level. We're right. discussing in the United States about the healthcare bill, etc., and the fallacy of it all is in the paradigm itself. It's, it's it's just beyond what people are discussing. We know it. So here we have Mac Mello, who is uh, one of the hosts at Cardiac Radio, in beautiful programs of mediumistic books brought in by Chico Xavier, and he's asking you, Doctor Alexander, about the following. Let me read it. He says, what do you say to those who say that chemicals in the brain is what created all those images and sensations that you felt while away in the comatose state? Well, because it doesn't work that way. And uh, I covered this very briefly in Proof of Heaven, talking about uh, uh, the measurement paradox in quantum physics uh, and of the hard problem of consciousness, uh, following in the thinking of people like Penfield, uh, the neurosurgeon who is in a better position than just about anybody to kind of answer this question. It was very clear to him how mind is not created by a uh, brain at all. Um, and in fact, this is something that Karen and I go into in great detail uh, in living in a mindful universe. Now for the scientists out there, what I would recommend is uh, you look, there's several wonderful books uh, uh, that were edited by uh, Ed Kelly of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the uh, University of Virginia. The first book is called Irreducible Mind Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. Uh, the second book is called Beyond Physicalism uh, Toward a Reconciliation of Science and Spirituality. These are listed on my website, ebenalexander.com, on the suggested reading list. Um, and they basically do a tremendous uh, amount of good in pointing out the complete um, nonsense of the materialist model of brain creates consciousness. It's never gone anywhere. This is something that uh, we discuss in great detail in living in a mindful universe. And I think it's important to point out because first and foremost, the gift that comes from realizing the primacy of consciousness, creating the brain and all of physical matter uh, is healing. Uh, is becoming more whole. I mean, we've known about the placebo effect, uh, mm -hmm. or called it that, since the mid-1950s. Placebo effect is looked on by big pharma as one of the greatest enemies, because, in fact, it automatically erects a 30% a uh, threshold. And, you, and because pharma admits that for many things, chronic pain and all kinds of other uh, illnesses and things that people take medication for, that the placebo effect alone, that is just the belief that taking a pill might make you better, is sufficient to make people better about 30% of the time. And so obviously our mind has tremendous power in the abilities to make us better and deliver health. Uh, and I would say that any health at all, whether you're talking about physical, mental, or emotional health, is first and foremost spiritual health. And by spiritual, what I mean is uh, acknowledging our interconnectedness, that we are here for a purpose, that we are here connected with other beings, that in fact, when we come to really investigate it, we find with that that deep sense of connection is with that infinitely powerful and loving God, that deity. We are not separate from that God. And this is uh, where I think of some of my earlier assumptions about religious teaching from my orthodox uh, upbringing in North Carolina and, and Methodist Christianity uh, were misleading. Uh, and I'd say it's very crucial that we realize that that very spark of awareness, when you come to realize consciousness is fundamental in the universe and creating all that exists, then our connecting directly with that one consciousness, with that one mind, is what enables us to have so much power. And that's just the beginning of explaining something like placebo effect. Now, to take it to the next level, I would point out what happens, for example, with me and my meningitis. Doctors who review my medical records come away just absolutely shocked that, you know, yes, I had a 2% chance of survival, so survival was not out of the question, but any kind of recovery to the point where I can 
talk about all this and write books about it, forget it. Those patients <laughs> never come back. So mine was truly a miraculous recovery. Well, guess what? In the world of near-death experiences, it should come as no surprise that you often find cases of miraculous recovery. Look at uh, Anita Morjani in her beautiful book, Dying to Be Me, uh, with a stage four uh, lymphoma that by all rights should have killed her with, within hours. That was back in February 2006. She had a profound NDE where she realized the reason she had cancer was due to her very fear of cancer. And in, uh, I won't simplify it that much, but if you read the book, you'll see it was a very profound connection she made. And when she saw that, she was able to realize that she could come back to this life uh, and, and do so beautifully and that the cancer would disappear. That's exactly what happened. Miracle cures in NDEs, uh, they're commonly encountered. It's just another way of saying deep spiritual growth. If we open up to all the possible lessons and let our prayers acknowledge that thy will not mine be done, that all is well as it is, and I'm accepting of where this goes, but to realize that often those miracle cures can be worked into the universe's plans for us if we're open-minded enough to grow through them. Another example is Mary C. Neal, an orthopedic surgeon uh, who wrote a, a book, uh, Heaven and Back, about her uh, kayaking accident in Chile back in 1999, I believe it was, where uh, she had an accident where she was flipped upside down underwater for 30 minutes. Mm. People don't come back from that underwater for 30 minutes. Uh, and was resuscitated there on the banks of this uh, river as far from anywhere as you could be uh, in southern Chile. Uh, and yet today she's back practicing orthopedic surgery. And she wrote a beautiful book about it. Miraculous healing can happen when we're open to the spiritual healing that is lying beneath these challenges that we face. So it's really waking up to that understanding of, of, of ourselves being connected spiritual beings that are directly connected with this infinite force of pure love and oneness. The more we come to acknowledge that and live it and bring it through us to share that love with the world, the more we heal our own hearts and journey uh, and come to realize that we do have tremendous power in operating our free will of our higher soul, not the free will of the little ego and its petty little interpersonal games, Forget that. But that's what we can overcome in meditation by developing that observer self that's able to see the higher good, can see how always our interrelationships with others. I deal with the higher soul of other beings who I might be dealing with on this world. But in those higher soul communications, we're able to come up with the win-win scenarios that allow all of us to flourish and thrive. And this is part of the gift of that going within, of meditation, uh, and why I highly recommend uh, whatever your means is, and if you think you've got too much monkey mind to meditate, <laughs> try the sacred acoustics tones, listen through headphones, you'll see what I mean. This opens a door to release us from the Maya, the illusion of the world as it appears, and come to have a far grander view of the world as it actually is that enables the free will of our higher soul in conjunction with the highest good for all to manifest the reality of our dreams. It's amazing that you're, you're mentioning this because uh, one of the questions of our dear friend Fred Govier from New York pertains to a selection of studies we have been doing in Spiritism through Kardec's works. When we go to the Medium's book, we talk, we learn about, you know, the fact that there, there are people incarnated, discarnated, that are not yet there, and we are also evolving, and uh, they, they want to harm people whether incarnated or discarnated, there are spirit attachments. So Fred Govea rescues a little bit of that discussion here. And as you're talking about that inner strengthening process, he's asking us, what would you recommend in regards to increase our spiritual energetic protection from adverse forces? Is it through the practice of meditation? Inevitably, we're, we're stumbling in the good and evil um, discussion here. Well, I, when I came back from my coma, I saw very clearly that this was not a battle between good and evil. What became very apparent to me is that unconditional love has infinite power to heal 
at all levels, whether we're talking about the individual human being, the individual uh, animal, any being in this, in this uh, creation, uh, the, the ethnic groups, national groups, all of humanity, all of life on earth, all of sentience throughout the universe. I don't care what level you're talking about. Unconditional love heals and, and, and makes it apparent that uh, those kind of situations where we perceive darkness and evil are just the absence of light and love. Each and every one of us can serve as a point of light to bring that love into this universe. And in such a way, um, that is how we can prove that uh, unconditional love will overcome any apparent forces of darkness and evil. This gets back at, uh, to what I said a, a few minutes ago about uh, some of the conflicts in this world. As much as people talk about defeating the enemy and military strikes and all of this, at the end of the day, the only way we're ever going to come out of uh, this kind of conflict is by sharing these acts of kindness and compassion between human beings and showing that love that is our natural uh, state. This is uh, taking care of the least, the last, and the lost in this world. All of us are part of that process. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, you know, when you start realizing the concept of the one mind, that we're all part of that one mind, you realize when I hurt someone else, I am hurting myself in a very real fashion. And if I don't come to realize that in this lifetime, I will certainly come to realize it in the life review. The Life Review has been uh, talked about, written about for thousands of years. It's not a new age concept. Uh, it occurs in somewhere between 30 and 50% of NDEs that are out there by the millions. Uh, and the Life Review is very clearly reliving the events of our lives. And the Life Review shows two very crucial things. One is that the boundaries of self are false. Because in a life review, we experience the impact of our actions and thoughts on others from their point of view. So in the life review, we kind of go back to that one mind that's experiencing it on the receiving end. But we witness that as the giver end, as the subject of that life review. Now, the other piece of the life review uh, is that the uh, what we experience there is so rich and robust and complete, more complete than it is part of the Maya. Uh, that in fact, it is built in on this side of the veil. That time flow is a deep mystery to modern physics. Um, it looks more than anything like all we really have to work with is an eternal now. That eternal now that projects into both the past and the future. But this eternal now is what is evolving. But it's not evolving through that four-dimensional space-time, earth time that we think it is. It's actually evolving in what I call deep time, uh, which is... A kind of a higher view of all of this. It's a view that we can attain in deep meditative states uh, outside of the Maya of the here and now illusion. Um, but it's it's getting that much bigger picture uh, that then allows us to make more sense of this and then to operate the free will of our higher soul in manifesting uh, that higher good for all involved. You're talking about free will and uh, the the day we celebrate freedom. Fourth uh, of July in the United States is also very meaningful for the world and the impact of uh, independence of the United States to the world and how it really boosted the this the importance of achieving this freedom. So you're talking about inner freedom, and it makes us go back to you're talking about free will. Emmanuel, through Chico Xavier, the most renowned spiritist medium of all times, wrote a book named Thought and Life. And there he says, our will is the driving force of the soul. As you're saying, our will can shift everything. So as we are approaching the celebration of freedom, and we know Earth is going through a very critical time, as you already mentioned here today. What would you like to mention in regards to this quest for this spiritual freedom that people are, that everybody is in, not only on the earth, but in the universe? What would you like to say in that regard, Dr. Alexander? Well, you know, um, one of the concepts that I've talked about uh, often, and in fact, um, had in one of the manuscripts for our books, although it didn't quite make the final cut, 
was the notion that we're really facing the 250 year or quarter millennium echo of the work of people like Thomas Jefferson and, and James Adams and James Madison. What they were fighting for uh, back in uh, the mid you know, 1700s was a battle for the political freedom of the individual. Uh, to free them from the shackles of control by other humans that had evolved with various uh, forms of government, uh, you know, and monarchies and what have you over a long period of time. This was an effort by Jefferson and others to liberate uh, the soul and kind of the political world of individuals dwelling in this four-dimensional space-time. And I thought it was interesting that a quarter of a millennium later, uh, that a lot of the work going on in this area, we moved to Charlottesville um, a few years ago. It's a, an astonishing place. Virginia uh, is right at the front of some of the revolution in modern thinking around consciousness. And again, this gets right back to the work, for example, of uh, Ed Kelly and others at Division of Perceptual Studies, University of Virginia, where, for example, they have more than 2,500 cases of past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation. The Division of Perceptual Studies, a very innovative uh, and exciting scientific group that's looking at the science of all this, but from the big side, not from the puny little uh, materialist side that, that is going, looking through the big end of the telescope, you know, expecting to see something. You're supposed to look through the eyepiece. Uh, and, our, and Ed Kelly and, and others, modern scientists, are really looking through the eyepiece finally. Much of science uh, has been looking through the big end and not seeing anything. That's because they're doing it all completely backwards. Uh, the whole model's backwards. And so really this kind of work and this growth in consciousness studies that we see focused today in these groups here in Virginia and elsewhere around the world that are spearheading this awakening of humanity uh, in many ways is just an echo of what Thomas Jefferson and others were doing to try and liberate the individual in our uh, material world. And what we're trying to do is further uh, that liberation uh, by freeing us from the shackles of materialist science that tries to pretend that we're all separate uh, and that we are parts of a chaotic and meaningless uh, wheel, a uh, machine that's turning without purpose, whereas in fact, I would say the entire universe exists to support this soul school, to support sentient beings being able to live these lives knowing full well that when we're incarnate in physical form, we're dumbed down to our higher knowledge of our higher soul between lives, uh, that this is all a process of learning and teaching, but that we don't have infinite knowledge between lives because, in fact, all of consciousness is evolving. And it's not just about humans. It's not just about life on Earth. It's a much bigger evolution of consciousness that we are all part of. And that is the reason it's all happening now. To wrap up, we're leading to our beautiful program also. You know, this program is leading us into the July 4th program when we are aiming at uh, rescuing the spiritual identity of America. You are American, but I know you feel connected to the whole universe. You you're no longer feel separated. But as somebody who was born in America in this life, would you like to say a message to the world? I think the biggest message out there is that each and every one of us, you know, American and all around this world and human and beyond has the power to change this world for the better. And the more we come to realize how we're all in it together and that we are part of that one mind, the more we can realize. Uh, that the, the binding force that binds this whole universe together is love. And love in an unconditional form without any kind of attachments to outcome, that love has tremendous power to shift everything. I often praise it, it's the love of the creator for the creation. And given that we are all co-creators and really one with that infinite healing power of that divine creative source, uh, we can come to bring this beautiful dream of harmony and of health and of healing and of brotherhood, sisterhood, and taking care of each other, uh, we can bring that to the fore. And that is how we will join that far grander community that pervades this entire universe that is one of love and of compassion and of caring and of acts of kindness. And this is one of the deepest truths. And of course, uh, it's 
there's really no way that I look at any kind of boundary between nations or ethnic groups, uh, even between species, as having any basis in reality in the face of this one mind and of this binding power of love. Dr. Alexander, you know, there are no words to express, but just to say, we want to give you a hug. <laughs> well, and I love hugs. So <laughs> I'll, I'll hug any and all. So thank you very much. My hugs go out to your audience and to all others on this beautiful uh, July 4th weekend. And let's remember, it's all about bringing that freedom and liberation to each and every one of us. And that freedom is based in love and compassion. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, we look forward to your next works. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, dear listeners and viewers. We hope you have enjoyed and that you keep it up. As you know, Dr. Alexander gave it all to you. So now you multiply. Many blessings and until July 4th. <laughs>